Well, at the age of 65, ladies and a few gentlemen, uh, naturally I've got tons of stories. I didn't bring in any pictures because I have difficulty in remembering myself uh, back 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I've got a picture on my 40th anniversary of Bosphorus University, which was 75. Your moms were getting born. And I put that bloody small picture, a photocopy, on, the, on my office, on my back. The guys came in and they said, is she your granddaughter? <laughs> so what can I say? This is my life. There's this quote from Alvin Toffler that I love. And he says, the illiterate of the 21st century are not the ones who cannot read and write. They will be the ones who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I think with all this 65 years on my back, 45 years almost in the business life, I think my synthesis of my life, of the career I made, of the life I created for myself, I think the synthesis are three words, courage, passion, and curiosity. These three words shaped me. I had my wrongs. I made a lot of mistakes, huge ones. I had my failures. I have my weaknesses. I have a few strengths. And I'm still trying to learn to live with Neriman. And I tell you, living with Neriman is a challenge. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me. Sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I have to live with you all day long. <laughs> it's tough. Yes, but what life is all about, life is what you make out of it. And you make your life. You're the sole responsible and accountable person of how you define and design your life. Life is a set of options, and the decisions you make around these options define your life. And this is how we built up our unique selves. I was born to a well-educated family with good parents, with two younger brothers. I think it was a good start. My mom was what you would call a classical school marm, a schoolmaster, and she is the one that really inserted into me the sense of courage, fearlessness, and the passion. Try to imagine it. 60 years ago, there is a young girl in a city called Bursa, a mother beyond her time, really beyond her time, dictated her daughter, saying that a girl had to invest in herself to become a citizen of the world 60 years ago. Not a citizen of the town, not the citizen of the country that she was residing in, but the citizen of the world. My mom was a Georgian. My pop was a half Greek, half Turkish guy. So I'm coming from a very strange, very unique, multicultural, diversified origin. And it was a good, solid start. What I did, I didn't do much. I just kept up with the courage, a lot of passion, a bit of curiosity, and I built up Neriman. I remember clearly a turning point in my life. This uh, speaker's theme are becoming a reunion of Robert College, but thanks God, in our days, it was called American College for Girls, okay? Sorry, sorry, I'm senior enough. And I'm coming from the senior class, by the way. And I've got the Centennial Award. Okay. The, remember, the turning point was this. I was just arriving into the border, as a border student in the dormitory. There were a lot of teeny bitty girls like me in the dormitory. And I called up my mom on the telephone. Telephoning was, not, was an issue, eh? so you had to wait for hours. 
to tell and to talk about my anxieties uh, for my future grades uh, and my loneliness, uh, my need for affection. A lot of blah, blah. In reality, what I was just asking, I was imitating my teeny bitsy dormitory girls and I was asking for a nice big bosom, and she had one, thanks God, to tell me all would be all right, my baby, don't worry, I'm here, I'm your mom. Because all the other moms were doing that on the phone, and they're flooding the school over the weekends. I was the only dude alone. What my mom did to a 10-year-old girl was that she said, you made a choice in your life, Neno. That's my name in the family, because Neriman is a very strange name. <laughs> and she didn't name me. My doctor named me, as I understand. Yes, Neriman is a masculine name. Did you know that? Yes. It's, it comes from Iran, and it's a masculine name in their mythology. means something like the Greek mythology of Hercules. Look at me. It's me. Okay. No, it was a mistake, because my pop was expecting a boy, and I arrived as a girl, something missing. And he didn't name me. So the doctor, my pediatrician, was named Neriman, and she said, okay, let's write my name. <laughs> That's how I got my name. So my mom told me on the phone, it took half a minute, she said, you made a decision for your life, and I'm proud of your decision. Now, take the responsibility of it. As a woman, myself, I have a family to take care of, two younger brothers that I have to manage, I've got a husband, and I've got a full career. Leave me alone, and don't disturb me with your petty personal problems ever. I learned something very serious. That was the starting point. I was the one responsible and accountable for my life. And I have to take the responsibility and the accountability of it. Did I have the same courage to do it with my kids? No. And naturally, as the story goes, the college girls, either they get married and become a very intellectual housewife, or they go to the university. I went to the Robert College Yuxek, as we called it in those days. Now it's the Bosphorus University. But it was such a, such a nice and easy university after college, senior uh, schooling. I did two majors, one in operations research, because in my days, industrial engineering didn't exist. <laughs> and I did one in accounting and finance. It was really easy. It was a lot of fun. And another funny thing is, uh, looking back, in those years, we didn't have coaching. We didn't hear about mentoring. Human resources didn't even exist. So, with the wonderful courage of the ignorance and lack of awareness of the gender diversity, glass walls, glass ceilings, I started off. And I learned. I made mistakes. I tumbled. I stood up. I unlearned and I relearned. And I made a life on my own. You make who you are. You make who you want to be. You are the only one you have to live with. And please keep up to make yourself proud of yourself. Because this is vitally important. And we're talking of change, ups and downs, whatever. Yes, change is inevitable. Change is always there. Change is every day, every moment in our life. The world is changing, and nowadays the new terminology is disruptively. That didn't exist 50 years ago. Now it's disruptive. Technology is changing, markets are changing, business is changing, demands are changing, clients are changing, pastry shops are changing, chefs are on the television. Before then, we had the, I don't know, we had these all the ceramic tubs uh, on the television yeah. in my days. Uh, now is chefs on the television. And the expectations of the generations are changing. I see on the end, edge of the floor, I see a lot of youngsters, young ladies. Yes, your expectations are not the expectations of my era. You are completely different. And uh, 
How can you not change with all this change around you? This is where you need to have a bit of curiosity to understand, to assess, to have the antenna to feel, to sense the change around you. And you have to keep up this courage here to be readily embracing all these alterations around you. Because otherwise you cannot survive. You will fade away. And you cannot. You're not allowed to fade away. One, you're a woman. Two, you're young. You've got a long life ahead of you. If you try to fade away, you become old, ladies. Don't let yourself become old. And as Toffler says, you know what we do? We learn. Then we start unlearning. And by unlearning, we relearn. So this is an incredible fugue of Bach. It's an eternal movement. It's wonderful. At the very beginning of my career, which is 45 years ago, there weren't even computers. Can you believe it? We were not doing this all day long. <laughs> we didn't have the opportunity, and we didn't have the, you know, this, all these machines around. Leave alone the emails. You had to make many phone calls to keep up the communication with your departments, with your people, with your colleagues. I'm not sure there are many who would remember those days. But come emailing, companies embraced this change because it was a wonderful efficiency work. With one email, you could have reached, I don't know, hundreds of people, and reducing the time, a lot of energy, efficiency, whatever. You know what happened at the beginning? The people, the colleagues who sent the emails called up the recipients to make sure that they received the emails. <laughs> it took years to change that. Really years. And unlearning is a process of accepting the change. Rewinding yourself. Forgetting your old habits, leaving them behind yourself, and getting ready for the new. And it takes time. It's not easy. If you are not aware, it can take ages. Please keep your curiosity intact. Try to feel it. Keep yourself open. Keep your senses open. If not anything else, trust me, keeping yourself open will keep you young at heart, at, at brain. This, this helps a lot. At the age of 65, I look at like 25, this is the reason why. As a seasoned, if not old, HR professional, my accountability is to work with people, to work with the people, to ensure that the organizations reach their strategic targets. This is the easiest and the quickest way of defining my job, my role. But I have a bigger responsibility, and I can create a bigger impact for the sustainability of the organizations, because I have to be aware of the need of the change and the organizational capabilities that the organizations will need for the future to be sustainable, to keep up profitability, to be able to be accountable, and to survive. And I still work with people. I still work for the people. Not only you, ladies and a few gentlemen, but also the organizations need to embrace the change. So it's not only for the people, but it's the organizations, it's the social life that needs to embrace the change and be ready to, for the new. So this brings us to the good old Darwin. Darwin says, as you know, I went back to the basics, the quotations 101, okay? <laughs> no, this is, this is the best. This, these are the ones I remember. The rest is too big. He said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. 
Another guy called Thomas Frey. This guy is a futurist and is talking of bloody hardcore issues. And he says, by 2030, ladies, two billion jobs will be extinct. Two billion jobs around the globe. Another research tells us that 40% of the things, the jobs and the positions and the competencies and the skills we use in the offices will be extinct in the coming 20 years. Will one of your job be one of the extinct ones? Are you in need of risk killing? You know, the CEO of Sony last year, not this year, most probably this year he was very busy working on his engineers. Last year in Davos said that I have the, he said, quotation, I have the best engineering army of the world around the age of 40s. They're very skilled guys, thousands of them. But with the disruptive technology around me, I know, I'm aware that I have to reskill them, but the bloody issue is I don't know how. So, we have certain problems. In order to be adaptable, in order to be versatile, you have to be ready ready to embrace. You have to be alive. You have to be sensible. You have to feel. You have to be one. You're each one of you guys. You're unique. But you have to be aware of your assets. You have to be aware of your values. You have to be aware of your potential. And be, try to be a round person. Not one with one skill, with a few skills. Not one with, with un, one understanding, but a lot of understanding. I don't know how many of you have hobbies. At least have two or three hobbies. I don't know how many of you have reading habits. I'm not talking of being online with the Twitters and updating the Facebook accounts. It's important. It's very, very important. For me, it's very important to get in touch with my grandchildren. But reading is enrichment. Enrich yourselves. How many, I don't know how many of you have, are part of the social responsibility projects. This gives you a wonderful enrichment in your soul. You become a really respectful citizen of the communities that you're living in. Keep up with the community work. Try to do it. Stretch yourself with your targets. So try to stretch yourself with your ambitions. You can be anything. You've got the potential in you. You just have to trust yourself and be ready to embrace. I wish you all good luck. And if you need an HR manager, an HR support, I will be around until I go on my pension. Then I will do my passionate work going into the community, dealing with my you know, grandchildren, and cooking. Uh-uh, that's me. Good luck with everybody. everybody. Take care.